Hideo Kojima, genius, auteur, snobby wanker, pretentious self filating knob, all of the above? Hideo Kojima is one of the most talked about game designers in the history of the industry. Joining Shigeru Miyamoto, Hidetaka Miyazaki, and Yoko Taro from Japan, Hideo Kojima's characters, narratives, and game design choices have gone on to influence at least two generations of younger developers. Rather than explore his influence, however, this video essay will explore what influenced Kojima, specifically focusing on one literary reference Kobo Abe. Kobo Abe is a Japanese author most famous to both Western and Japanese literature buffs for his book Suna no Onna, The Woman in the Dunes. Since the release of Death Stranding, popular interest in Kobo Abe has revived due to a quote from his short story, Nawa, or The Rope, being used at the beginning of the game. Born in the 1920s, Abe spent his childhood in Japanese-occupied Manchuria. Returning to Japan, he studied medicine but never practiced. While in university, he began his writing career. By the late 1950s and early 1960s, he published the works for which he is most well known. Suitcase and Cliff of Time in 1955, The Man Who Turned Into a Stick in 1957, Suna no Onna in 1962, Tanin no Kao in 1964, and The Boxman in 1973. In my mind, I can clearly picture Kojima as a scruffy economics college student browsing his library or counterculture bookstore, stumbling upon this bizarre author, and falling in love with his style. I myself had similar experiences with Thomas Pynchon, David Foster Wallace, and a few other authors during my college years. Abe's work can best be compared to Kafka, with surreal and strange happenings that will leave you scratching your head most of the time. To illustrate, I'm going to attempt to summarize The Boxman. The Boxman is a story about a man known simply as A. He is a photographer and one day sees a boxman outside his window. A boxman is a man who wears a cardboard box that covers the upper half of his body. There is a flap at the front to look out of, holes on the left and right near the ears for better hearing, various hooks for hanging things, and wires to reinforce the corners. This is somewhat different from a homeless person. A homeless person is someone who does not choose to be homeless, but according to Abe, a boxman chooses to sever all ties to his past, identity, and society, becoming in some sense invisible. This photographer sees a boxman and ends up shooting him with an air rifle. In turn, this photographer becomes obsessed with the idea of losing himself, and upon finding a boxman's box, starts living in it. The narrative then switches to this new boxman. He also gets shot by an air rifle, making it seem like perhaps we are taking the point of view of the first boxman instead. However, he talks about being a photographer. He goes to the doctor to get the pellet removed and becomes enamored of the nurse. She makes an offer to buy the box from him for 50,000 yen, which in today's dollars is about two grand. He leaves the office to return to his hangout under a bridge. 
She does not make the meeting time, instead dropping the money off the bridge with a note asking him to destroy the box. What follows is a really surreal section where he daydreams about being a fish and decides to go to the hospital to confront her. There, he sees the nurse in an examination room naked with a fake box man. This fake box man is later identified as the doctor, although it is hinted that the doctor and the nurse may both be imaginary characters as the box man scribbles some notes under the bridge. The doctor offers to allow the box man to do whatever he wants with the nurse, as long as he can watch in the room from inside his box. There are several documents attached to the narrative at this point. For example, an affidavit by the doctor, in which he claims that he is not actually a doctor, but simply a medical assistant to a military doctor. He assumed the identity of this doctor, who had become a drug addict during the war, and whose health gradually deteriorated more and more. The nurse, in turn, is not actually a nurse. She is a model who came to the hospital for an abortion, but lacking any means of paying for it, agreed to work at the clinic. The original nurse was the wife of the real doctor, who, at the doctor's behest, had apparently started up a sexual relationship with the fake doctor. She left when the fake doctor started a sexual relationship with the fake nurse. It is also implied at this point that the box man is possibly the real doctor. He's run away or escaped somehow. Then there's a section that details a young boy who builds a periscope in order to spy on a gymnastics teacher as she uses the bathroom, which segues into a short story about Chopin taking a piss stop by the side of the road while his father naturally wearing a box over his body, pulled him up a hill to his fiancée's house. She spied him peeing, and so they had to call off the wedding. Instead, Chopin and his father went to the city, where Chopin would make dozens upon dozens of tiny portraits of his lost love, which he sells to support himself and his father. His father, during all these years and decades, stays inside the box, and Chopin shows disappointment that the portraits he draws show his love as he remembers her, but the real woman has aged horribly. The final section of the book seems like some kind of masturbatory fantasy. It depicts the life of the doctor slash fake boxman living together with the nurse. The book comes to a sudden close with the note reminding the reader that the most important part of choosing a box is to leave oneself lots of area for taking notes on the inside of the walls. The Boxman explores themes of identity, what it means to see someone, what it means to be seen by someone, and the sexualized versions of these, voyeurism and exhibitionism. It is never clear whether the photographer at the beginning is the same person as the later Boxman nor how much credence should be given to the affidavit by the doctor. The box, further, is often compared to the chrysalis of a butterfly. A man enters the box, but the box is a space of gestation or transformation, and it is not clear what leaves the box. The nature of identity is thus characterized as murky, fluid, and subject to interpretation and negotiation. In James C. Scott's Seeing Like a State and Against the Grain, 
He explores how government reforms typically focus on making this murkiness and fluidity impossible for their citizens. The Chinese emperor, Qin Shi Huan, for example, famously reformed the weight and measure systems and the writing system. The early rulers of agrarian societies often forced their citizens to grow crops such as corn, wheat, and rice instead of potatoes, yams, or other root plants. The logic behind these moves is to make collecting and administrating taxes easier. Having a standard system of weights lets the government check whether their farmers are cheating by using a basket or jar that is slightly smaller than the standard one. Grain crops allow for relatively easy calculations based on the grain and fertility of the land and the area of the land. Root crops can more easily be hidden from tax collectors, buried as they are. As historians of math have noted, geometry can be traced to governments trying to calculate just such amounts areas of land and volumes of grain or oil. Similarly, early arithmetic is rooted in such tax collection. Having a set writing system makes the assigning of names, recording of property rights and family lineages much easier, again facilitating the government taking its cut. You cannot properly tax a village if you don't know how many people you should be taxing, after all. Scott terms this legibility. Governments strive for having a clear set of objects they can operate on. We can look at various modern arts and lifestyles as reintroducing this murkiness back into our lives. Postmodernism and surrealism, the move of various groups away from more locked-in romantic and working relationships towards shorter-term contingent ones seem to indicate minor rebellions against such systems of control. Meanwhile, the man who turned into a stick and its connected plays, and the short story The Rope, seem to have exerted a massive influence on certain parts of Death Stranding. To help highlight the points, I'll again provide summaries of these. The Rope opens with an old junkyard watchman. He has more or less given up on preventing a group of young boys from breaking in and playing, and has decided to watch them instead. As he watches them, on this particular occasion, he sees that they look more serious than usual, and have a young dog with them. They do something to the dog with a stick that makes it difficult for it to walk. I'm not really sure what they do. It is not described in the story. The old man just looks at them, and suddenly he understands what they will do. Eventually, the boys put the dog in the tank of a half-buried boiler and are unable to get it back out. At this point, two soaking wet girls enter the junkyard with a wet rope. The boys want to use this rope to get the puppy out, and the girls acquiesce. Okay? The old man goes to take a piss and sees another man looking through another hole in the wall into the junkyard. He seems horrified by what is happening and wants to enter the yard to stop his daughters, the two girls. The girls are strangling the puppy using the rope. Upon seeing this, the old man lets their father into the yard, and he tries to convince them to come home. The puppy has already been strung up and is dangling dead from a pipe. There is a lot of back and forth between the father and the girls. The gist of it seems to be that the girls wanted to put the dog out of his misery, 
and they don't want to go back with their father, who is apparently a drunk and a gambler. He gives them his shoes, saying they could sell them for a few bucks. He leaves, having unsuccessfully tried to get them to come back with him. The old man tries to give some money to the girls, and tells them they should leave their deadbeat dad. The older girl becomes fascinated by a black ocean that has appeared inside the boiler, which she can see through some holes in its side. The story then switches to nighttime outside the ramshackle house of the father and the two girls. The father is asleep inside, and they use the rope from before to strangle him now. Finding some money under the pillow, they give him back his shoes and take a dollar. The story then closes with this quote, which also appears at the beginning of Death Stranding. The rope and the stick, together, are one of humankind's oldest tools. The stick is for keeping evil away. The rope is for pulling good toward us. These are the first friends the human race invented. Wherever you find humans, the rope and the stick also exist. Even now, they are like members of our family, infiltrating and living in every residence. This play features three characters. A woman, her female guest, and a suitcase, played by a mostly naked male actor. The woman and her guest discuss the locked suitcase, which belongs to her husband. It makes strange noises, and the woman complains about it. Her husband has claimed that his ancestors are in it, and the woman and her guest debate whether or not she should open it or spray some insecticide in it, as sometimes it makes insect-like noises. The play closes with the woman claiming her guest is jealous or envious in some way, and the guest leaving. The author has claimed that this play is about birth, and the different elements of the play seem to bear this out. The way the man casually dismisses his wife's worries about it seems to mirror the cavalier attitude of some men for their wives' pregnancies. Claiming that it contains his ancestors is similar to how a baby contains the genes from the man and woman, which they got from their parents, etc., etc., into the past. The discussion about opening it or using insecticide parallels having the baby or getting an abortion. The story of Cliff of Time follows a boxer. He is monologuing to himself about his daily routine, recent past fights, and we also hear his thoughts during a boxing match and during the breaks. Abe has subtitled this play, Process. By talking about his routines and the diary that he keeps, we get a sense of repetition. These repetitions seem in some way to mirror Camus' discourse regarding Sisyphus, each day doing the same action, getting the same result, and having to do the same thing the next day. The cliff referenced in the title may be an homage to the mountain that Sisyphus pushes his rock up, or it may have a different meaning, as in a flat, repetitive plateau representing life with a sharp plunge into the next state of death. This play is the most obtuse for me. It follows a discussion between a man and woman from hell about the eponymous man-stick. A man has suddenly turned into a stick while at a shopping mall with his son. The son is stricken, and there is a hippie couple on the street where the stick drops off the roof of the shopping center. Even though she can't 
The man and woman from hell have the job of collecting these sticks and judging them. The hippie couple don't want to give up the stick, and there is a lot of strange conversation at cross purposes. In the end, the man and woman from hell complete their job and go on to the next one. Turning into a stick represents something, but it is not 100% clear what. Abe has subtitled the play Death, so that is one of the symbols we can use. Becoming a stick is dying. After you die, there is a sham of judgment, but actually we are not judged. The quote from the rope about ropes and sticks being tools though, makes me think there are elements of social instrumentality here. A man who becomes a stick becomes a tool, an object, which society, a company, etc. can make use of. We have human resource departments, after all. Certain phrases from the play convince me that this is the case. Abe's most famous work, Sunna no Onna, The Woman in the Dunes, is essentially a novel-length meditation on we live in a society, subject matter. So this kind of commentary is not foreign to Abe. In his 2019 book, The Creative Gene, Hideo Kojima himself has said that Abe has deeply influenced him. There are a large number of points where the influence of Abe on Kojima can be seen. Starting with the surface level, naming schemes. Abe tends to name his characters in bland and uninteresting ways. In The Boxman, there are only two named characters. Yoko Toyama, who is only named once, and in all other instances is referred to as the nurse, and Chopin. Everyone else is named after a letter of the alphabet, A, B, C, and D, or identified by their job, the photographer, the nurse, the doctor, the boxman, the fake boxman. In Abe's other works, he also uses this type of naming. In the play The Cliff of Time, there are two characters, the boxer and the voice. In The Man Who Turned Into a Stick, there are six characters, Man from Hell, Woman from Hell, The Man Who Turned Into a Stick, Hippie Boy, Hippie Girl, and Voice from Hell. Although the protagonist is named in Woman in the Dunes, Junpei Nikki, his name is only mentioned twice and is referred to in all other places simply as the man. The eponymous woman in the dunes is similarly just called the woman. For his part, Kojima names many of his characters using adjectives or after some key feature. Quiet, Fragile, Vamp, Hartman, Bridget Strand, Sniper Wolf, Revolver Ocelot, etc. The names of the soldiers who join your army in MGSV follow a similar scheme. Raging Hippo, Timid Leopard, etc. Second, the use of complex narrative structures and techniques to the point of absurdity. Abe's works often feature strange event sequences, fever dream-like elements, and revelations that reverse or call into question previous pieces of information. Similarly, every Kojima game, from Metal Gear Solid to Death Stranding, features a story that is comically complex. Third, a high-level exploration of abstract themes. Abe's The Boxman looks at identity, sight, fate, and the nature of reality. The trilogy of Suitcase, Cliff of Time, and The Man Who Turned Into a Stick 
explore birth, life, and death. I was in the hospital waiting for a Kojima's Metal Gear Solid explores genes and destiny. MGS2 and MGSV both explore identity. And Death Stranding explores the cycle of life and death and the importance of human connection. I hope that fans of Metal Gear Solid had light bulbs going off during the above discussion about the connections between the Boxman's exploration of identity and the history of government reforms regarding writing, crop growing, and taxation. The history of government systems of regulation and control strongly parallels the various schemes of control that the philosophers, the patriots, and other groups in MGS try to execute. In some sense, both Kojima and Abe want to wake us up to the fact that we are all living in the Matrix, an artificial reality that is a system of control and one not necessarily arranged for our benefit. A fourth point is minutia. In The Boxman, Abe describes in detail how you can make yourself a box to become a boxman. Precisely what dimensions are best, where to cut the viewing ports, what to cover the ports with, how to insulate it in the winter, how to reinforce it with wire and where the wire should go, and more. The amount of detail can be overwhelming and mind-numbing. For example, here is just part of the description for how to make a box. Instructions for making a box. Materials. One empty box of corrugated cardboard. Vinyl sheet. Semi-transparent, 20 inches square. Rubber tape, water resistant, about 8 yards. Wire, about 2 yards. Small pointed knife, a tool. To have on hand, if necessary. Three pieces of torn canvas and one pair of work boots in addition to regular work clothes for streetwear. Any empty box a yard long by a yard wide and about four feet deep will do. However, in practice, one of the standard forms, commonly called a quarto, is desirable. Standard items are easy to find, and most commercial articles that use standard-sized boxes are generally of irregular shape various types of foodstuffs precisely adaptable to the container, so that the construction is sturdier than others. The most important reason to use the standardized form is that it is hard to distinguish one box from another. As far as I know, most boxmen utilize this quarto box. For if the box has any striking features to it, its special anonymity will suffer. Even the common variety of corrugated cardboard has recently been strengthened, and since it is semi-waterproof, there is no need to select any special kind, unless you are going through the rainy season. Ordinary cardboard has better ventilation and is lighter and easier to use. For those who wish to occupy one box over a period of time, regardless of the season, I recommend the frog box, especially good in wet weather. This box has a vinyl finish, and as the name suggests, it is exceedingly strong in water. When new, it has a sheen, as if oiled, but apparently it produces static electricity easily, quickly absorbs dirt, and gets covered with dust. Then the edge is thicker than the ordinary one and looks wavy. You can tell it at once from the common box. To construct your box, there is no particular procedure to follow. 
First, decide what is to be the bottom and the top of the box. Decide according to whatever design there may be, or make the top the side with the least wear, or just decide arbitrarily. And cut out the bottom part. In cases where one has numerous personal effects to carry, the bottom part can be folded inward without cutting, and with wire and tape, the two ends can be made into a baggage rack. Tape the exposed part of the edges at the three points on the ceiling and at the one on the side where they come together. In Woman in the Dunes, he describes the exact size and shape of the sand particles, the deterioration of the materials in the building, and many other points. In similar fashion, Kojima will go on and on about the significance of the color, some special bacteria emitted when it died, or the fine print in nuclear arms agreements, or how certain things are supposed to work, either in his games or in the real world. Here is an example of Kojima going off the rails. To unite America and the entire world, the Major thought this was his friend's view. But I think he never understood what she wanted. Before he ever walked or cried, even before he was born, his mother tongue was English. He doesn't know the pain of losing his own language. Not yet. He cannot understand her will. I do. I was born in a small village. I was still a child when we were raided by soldiers. Foreign soldiers. Torn from my elders, I was made to speak their language. With each new post, my masters changed, along with the words they made me speak. Words are peculiar. With each change, I changed too. My thoughts, personality, how I saw right and wrong. War changed me. And not only my visage. Words can kill. I was invaded by words, burrowing and breeding inside me. A philosopher once said, It is no nation we have had, but a language. Make no mistake, our native tongue is our true fatherland. My fatherland. My truth was stolen from me. And so was my past. All that's left is the future. And mine is revenge. On those who leech off the words of their fellow man. This is what I learned from the Major. And then it hit me. It was he who should feel my wrath. He and the code he chose as basis for control. Language codes, information codes, beamed all around us, genetic codes spanning history. By controlling the codes, Cypher Zero intends to unify the Codes implanted into our heads, sucking our minds dry as it spreads from one host to the next. A parasite upon this earth, that is what Zero is. As one born into this world, he's afflicted. I hold him responsible for killing my freedom. Killing all traces of my past. Killing any promise of a future. We are all but dead men forced to walk upon this earth. A world reduced to zero. Cypher plans to use its codes to control the world. They think they can. And the mother tongue of all those codes is king. The word became flesh. The final parasite. 
It knows English. An English strain of the vocal parasite. I will exterminate the English language. With this, I'll rid the world of infestation. All men will breathe free again. Reclaim their past, present, and future. This is no ethnic cleanser. It is a liberator. To free the world from zero. Let the world be. Sans lingua franca, the world will be torn suddenly. And then it shall be free. People will suffer, of course. A phantom pain. The world will need a new common tongue. A language of nukes. My metal ears shall be the thread by which all countries are bound together. In equality. No words will be needed. Every man will be forced to recognize his neighbor. People will swallow they will link lost hands. The world will become war. This war is peace. The Boxman specifically seems to have exerted a huge influence on certain parts of MGS. First, there is the most famous mechanic of the MGS series. Snake can hide in a cardboard box, and the size and type of box is very similar to that described in the Boxman. Further, the way a Boxman is described in the book is like this. For example, in your case, I'm sure you've not yet heard of a Boxman. Though there can't be any statistics, there is evidence that a rather large number of them are living in concealment throughout the country. But I've never heard that boxmen are being talked about anywhere. Evidently, the world intends to keep its mouth tightly shut about them. Have you ever actually seen one? Let's stop fooling each other now. Certainly a boxman is hardly conspicuous. He is like a piece of rubbish shoved between a guardrail and a public toilet, or underneath a footbridge. But that's different from being inconspicuous or invisible. Since he is not especially uncommon, there is every opportunity of seeing one. Surely, even you have, at least once. But I also realize full well that you don't want to admit it. You're not the only one. Even with no ulterior motive, apparently one instinctively averts one eyes. Strikingly similar to what happens with Snake when he puts on the box. Most enemies ignore it at first, and then become confused. It can often be used for stealth, making the player invisible in some limited way. Further, the way that Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear Solid 2, and Metal Gear Solid V peel back layer after layer of illusion and lies until the opening quote of Metal Gear Solid V there are no facts, only interpretations. Frederick Nietzsche really strikes home. This is very similar to how the boxman opens with a relatively simple premise of a photographer becoming a boxman and continually revises this and updates it, muddies the waters until the truth of everything being described becomes so unparsable that the reader has no idea what is fact, fiction, delusion, lies, or hallucination. In particular, 
the fact that both Metal Gear Solid and The Boxman focus on identity in such similar ways seems like a clear case of influence. The doubled nature of Big Boss and his doppelganger in Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 has clear parallels to the Boxmen and Doctors in The Boxman. The fact that in MGSV, you play as this doppelganger of Big Boss, who turns out to be the field medic, a kind of doctor, also seems too close to be just coincidence. I've even seen a YouTube video claiming that actually this narrative is a put-on by Kojima. The truth, according to this video, is that the player character has been doubly hypnotized. The player is actually controlling Chico, the young boy that Big Boss went to rescue in MGSV Ground Zeroes. Chico has been brainwashed into believing that he is the medic, and then brainwashed again into believing that he is Big Boss. The Ishmael character in the first episode is actually the medic, who, you guessed it, has been brainwashed into believing that he is Big Boss. Big Boss is presumably using the two of them to enact his uber-dastardly plan for world domination. You see what I mean though about how the events of the Metal Gear Solid series are open to endless reinterpretation. Moving on to Death Stranding and its influences, the scene where Fragile is betrayed by Higgs echoes the scene from The Boxman where the titular Boxman waiting under the bridge feels he has been betrayed by the nurse. The main difference is the genders have been reversed. Snake, wait, don't from the rope, of course, Kojima kind of has taken the closing quote and the theme of connection and pulling towards us, and isolation and pushing apart. However, the use of the rope in The Rope is horrifying. Although it is used to pull the puppy out of the boiler, it is also used to strangle it, and later on, the father. This is hardly a purely positive tool for pulling the good towards us. In typical Kojima fashion, he seems to have hit upon this obscure quote by a relatively obscure author, and tried to imbue it with a meaning that it just doesn't have, even in the original story. And while we're talking about this quote, I think it is important to note its connection with Setsubun. This is a Japanese holiday celebrated on February 3rd. During this festival, a family member, usually the father, will don a demon mask, and the children will pelt him with roasted soybeans, chanting, Oni wa soto, fuku wa uchi. Devils out, good fortune in. This seems more clearly what Abe was thinking about with this division between attraction and repulsion, good and bad. In terms of tools, look, I'm not an anthropologist, but even going through a few articles on Wikipedia about tool use in humans and animals should be enough to disabuse anyone that this idea has any basis in reality. Apes often use sticks to get ants and grubs out of holes, effectively transforming the stick into a rope. They also use leaves and grass to wipe their mouths and their private parts when they are dirty. Are the leaves a stick or a rope? They also use rocks to smash shells of nuts or other hard-coated foodstuffs. Is the rock functioning as a rope, pulling the nutrition from the food? Is it a stick, 
since it is damaging or separating the inedible shell from the nut? Fire was probably one technique or tool that came very early in human history, and it doesn't seem to fall into either category. Ropes and sticks simply change the location of some object, pulling good towards us or pushing bad away. Fire is an essentially transformative tool. You take raw meat and you get cooked meat back, which has a different flavor, different digestive requirements, etc. The consumption of cooked meat has changed human anatomy in numerous ways, from jaw and jaw muscle size and gut size and others, and probably at least partially fueled the increase in brain size early in hominid history. Rocks, of course, are what many people think of as the first tools, but this is mostly because rocks last a long time, and any evidence of stick use would be vanishingly rare over hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. The rock tools of various cutters, scrapers, hammers, grinders, etc. also do not fall into this attraction-repulsion dichotomy. Going into hybrid tools, fishing rods and bows and arrows, by all accounts much later inventions, maybe only 100,000 to 50,000 years ago, combine ropes and sticks. As a whole, a fishing rod is used to pull fish in, while the bow is used to launch an arrow through the air. Both are used for hunting. Conceptually, are they both ropes? From this short examination, it should be clear that this idea is literal BS. And even metaphorically or conceptually, it just seems too simple to have much explanatory power. I'm sure the Kojima fellatio team will be up in arms at this point. God, why are you taking this so literally? It's symbolic! Or even throwing Kojima's own response from MGS3 around as well. Death Stranding spends an unreasonable amount of time having characters spout off total bullshit about dinosaurs with umbilical cords, how the previous massive extinctions were all caused by EEs and the beach, how chiralium can be found in different strata of rocks when those extinctions happened, and much more. If we are meant to think about these connections, what they mean, and how they are related, then we should be thinking critically about them and not just sucking down whatever brain fart happened to ejaculate out of Kojima because he had indigestion one Thursday afternoon during a cigarette break. The other main point that he seems to have taken is the image of the black ocean. Moving on to the three plays, the image of a suitcase doubling as a baby or fetus seems to be captured by the bridge babies. From Cliff of Time, in typical Kojima fashion, he has named Normus Reedus' father, Cliff. Cliff even gives a speech in which he uses his name in the geographic sense as an obstacle getting in the way of others instead of as a bridge, bringing people together. My son. My bridge to the future. Without you, I was just like any other cliff. Dead end. No way forward. Nothing but an obstacle. Looking on at the world people like you were trying to build. 
difficult. There is also the gameplay of Bridge Stranding itself. The packages that we carry to and from places are analogs of Sisyphus's rock. We never run out of more packages to deliver, no matter how many we carry to their destination. There will always be more deliveries awaiting us there, and when we hand those over, there will be still more. The topic of death and what awaits us after we die is a primary focus of both the man who turned into a stick and death stranding. Besides these themes and the reappearance of the stick reference, there doesn't seem to be much connecting the two. One extremely important difference between Abe and Kojima is their outlook on life. Abe's works are fundamentally dark and almost nihilistic. The two girls using the rope to kill their father is a good example. The rope is supposed to be used to pull the good toward us, and the girls use it to end the life of their father. While this may let them have a better life than if he was still alive, dragging them down, it is difficult to see the act in a positive light, and nothing about the framing of the event leads the reader to believe that their lives will actually improve. Given the earlier narrative tone, I can imagine Abe continuing the story by detailing the lives of the girls as they become streetwalkers catering to sentient canines or some such dark horror. Kojima, in contrast, goes out of his way to give some kind of hopeful ending to many of his games. In Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, after showing the player and Raiden how they have been lied to and manipulated all through the game and throughout their lives, Snake speaks to both and tells them that no matter what, our experiences remain our own, and going forward, we just need to pick something to do with our lives. It might be right, it might be wrong, but the important thing is to move forward with that purpose and live. We can examine it as we go along. This echoes some of the messages in Metal Gear Solid as well. The most we can say about DNA is that it governs a person's potential strengths, potential destiny. You mustn't allow yourself to be chained to fate, to be ruled by your genes. Humans can choose the type of life they want to live. Snake, whether or not you're in the Fox Die program isn't important. The important thing is that you choose life. And then live. Don't you think, Snake? Don't worry. I'm going to choose life too. Until today, I've always looked for a reason to live. But from here on, I'm going to just live. To wrap things up, there are many key points where Kojima has copied or borrowed techniques, themes, and story events from Kobo Abe themes of identity and the meaning of death, and the use of unreliable narrators to call into doubt previous story points link both. The naming conventions and the use of cardboard boxes further tie them together. The inclusion of vast amounts of minutia provides another similarity. I, for one, wish that Kojima had been able to copy the skill with which Abe incorporates magical or symbolic elements into the narrative to create metaphors about the human condition. You can't always get what you want, though. Thank you for listening.